The last time you saw this car was a full year ago, and in the time since then we've been hard at work on it. We had gotten the car and its blown small block Chevy 350 to the point where it was running well enough that I could actually rely on it. And as tradition goes, as soon as the car approaches a state of reliability, I need to take it all apart and make it entirely questionable again. And the way we'll be doing that this time is by buying more cheap Craigslist parts. Last time we installed that used 144 supercharger, but this time we're going to take it a step farther and replace the entire engine. Some would argue that by 1978 the Pontiac Firebird was no longer a muscle car. The biggest reasons for this were the emissions era and the loss of a factory big block engine option. This particular Firebird Esprit came with a Chevy 305 small block from the factory. Back when I first bought it in 2014, it had this Chevy 350 small block that the previous owner had bought off of eBay. These videos have received, well, not a small number of complaints that this Pontiac car has a Chevy engine in it. Keeping a Chevrolet engine in it may be sacrilegious to some, but since it came that way from the factory, I don't see why it's an issue. Moreover, the car is already set up for that style of engine, and it'll be much, much cheaper and easier to find an engine in that pattern and build it the way I would like to. And so, with that plan in my head, I set out looking for the most ubiquitous big block Chevy, the 454. I was looking for either a Mark IV so that I could keep a mechanical fuel pump, or a Mark VI for an all-around solid design and well-flowing cylinder heads. And after a few months of casual searching, I came across this listing. An 88 or 89 would be a late Mark IV, which is exactly what I wanted, and I would be replacing the intake and rebuilding the engine anyway. So, at $200, it seemed like the perfect choice. The seller said that his buddy had pulled the engine from a junkyard in Carlisle from an 88 or 89 Suburban. He said one of the cylinder heads had been removed and the bores looked good, but otherwise didn't know anything about it. The first thing that was obvious upon seeing the engine is that it was not from an 89 and it's not a Mark IV at all. This is a 5th generation 454, which is not the most desirable model. It's not so much that there's something wrong with this design in particular, it's just that it's not as compatible as the newer or older models. And it doesn't have the provision for a mechanical fuel pump like I had wanted to run. But I didn't think I'd be able to find one for cheaper, and I was already there, so we went ahead and shook hands on it. I very carefully rolled the engine past his terrifyingly nice Camaro, and we loaded it up in my truck. Since he felt a bit bad that the engine wasn't quite what I was looking for, he even threw in the engine cradle, which makes this an even better deal. I haphazardly strapped it down and drove home with all sorts of plans in my head about what was going to happen with this engine. It wasn't exactly what I'd wanted, but it was the price that I could afford at that time. The outside of the engine looks nice and rust-free, which is probably thanks to the quarter inch of grime covering it. The insides of the engine are definitely a question mark, but since it's just a lazy old big block, I figured it was probably okay. A good sign was that the engine rotated freely. You could pry between those bolts on the harmonic balancer and turn it over fairly easily. And with the engine finally back home, we'll unload it from the truck. With it on the ground and unhooked from the crane, we can roll it inside. Though not without a certain degree of difficulty since this is a heavy engine and the casters are not fantastic. But eventually we get it moving and into the corner of the garage, the only place there is currently space for it. It sat there for a little over two weeks before I finally found the time one evening to take the heads off and get a look inside it. The first thing we need to do is remove the valve covers. This is very easy because there is only one finger tight bolt holding each of them on. With those out of the way, the next thing we'll do is remove the rocker arms. These later generation engines use bolt-in, non-adjustable rockers. For the most part, I like this design because it keeps things simple. We'll use the impact gun to go through and very quickly remove all eight from this side of the engine. And with all of those off, we can remove the four pushrod guide plates that were underneath them. And then we'll grab each of the pushrods. There are different opinions out there about this, but I don't feel like it particularly matters for these parts, so I wasn't keeping track of which goes where. With all that stuff out of the way, the next thing we'll do is go around and remove all of the cylinder head bolts. Each head is held in by 16 bolts, and we'll loosen them by starting on the outside and spiraling towards the center. This detorquing procedure will help reduce the possibility of warpage, 
Some of them were pretty stuck in place, but luckily, unlike most of our rebuilds, none of them actually broke. Pretty soon, we have all but one of the bolts removed, and that one is just hanging on a few threads to help keep the cylinder head from jumping off. Not like it was about to budge on its own though, since the head was very stuck in place. The pry bar didn't seem to be doing anything, so we went straight for the big guns. And by that, I mean a 4 foot long 4x4 wedged into the intake valley that will hit on the end with a 2 pound dead blow hammer. That was able to do the trick straight away, so we'll remove that safety bolt and lift the head off. It probably goes without saying, but these iron heads are nice and heavy. We'll set that out of the way, and we can finally take a look in the cylinders. Unfortunately, this is where things started looking a little bit grim. The cylinder walls weren't terribly gouged or worn, but number four here was pretty rusty. And while the most obvious, it wasn't the only one. Water had definitely made its way through the intake ports on this engine and done some damage. We'll spray down the cylinders with WD-40 and wipe off at least a little bit of the surface rust before moving to the driver side to remove the other cylinder head. The process here is the same as before. First, we'll unbolt all of the rocker arms, then remove the guide plates and the push rods themselves. We'll spiral in and remove the cylinder head bolts, once again getting lucky not to break any, just leaving our one partially threaded in safety bolt. We'll crack the head loose with that same 4x4 and hammer, finish removing the last bolt, and carefully lift it off. And unfortunately, this side looks even worse than the other one. Cylinders 3 and 7 are looking pretty brown. And there are plenty of crusty, rusty flakes. Just like the other side, we'll spray it down and wipe off as much as possible. And with things looking a little bit better, we'll use a pry bar to turn the engine over a little bit. It feels maybe a little bit crunchy, but not all that bad when turning it. And with the pistons in new positions, we'll wipe down and spray down the cylinder walls once again. At this point, it was feeling much less crunchy. I wasn't too worried about gouging the cylinder walls with rust, since at the very least they needed a honing anyway. But if you weren't trying to do that kind of work, it would be best to not turn the engine over while there's crap in the cylinders. Most of the discoveries we made that night were a bit disheartening, but it's hard to tell the exact extent of the damage until we get the block farther apart. And a few nights later, we got back to work to do exactly that. In a little bit, we'll be removing the engine from this cradle and putting it on a rotating engine stand. We'll go ahead and put the lift chain on it right now, even though it's not going to help and is just going to get in the way for the next few steps. Anyway, we broke out this handy little tray to help organize the lifters as we remove them from the engine. I built this a while back to help with rebuilding the small block in the blazer. I whipped up this little valve train organizer because I'm too cheap to buy one, and it should work just fine here too. We'll remove the lifters one at a time using a magnet to lift them out of the bore. Except, well, it seems like they had been in there quite a while and they were a bit stuck. The wear on the camshaft lobes looked normal, so I didn't think any of these were mushroomed out, and it was probably just the varnish deposits at the base that were making them hard to remove. There are fancy tools to help with this, but what we have is a pair of needle nose pliers. We'll try to be careful not to mar them up, but since these lifters don't sink all the way down into their bores, it wouldn't really matter even if we did. The lifter was still being stubborn, so we went ahead and sprayed down all of them with some WD-40 to hopefully help loosen them up. And between that and working it back and forth, eventually the lifter finally came loose. We'll wipe it clean and drop it into our lifter organizer to keep track of which position it was in. And that's great and all, but we can't celebrate just yet because there are 15 more lifters that don't want to leave the block. Spraying them down seems to have made a difference, but there is definitely still some maneuvering involved in getting them out. Examining the lifters, I couldn't see any signs of deformation, so it's more likely that the varnish rings at the bottom were what were keeping the lifters in place. If they were deformed, or were even harder to remove than this, I would be worried that the lifter bores would be damaged trying to remove them. There doesn't appear to be any scratching of the lifter bores, and everything feels smooth, so we'll go ahead and take the rest out. And after about 15 minutes of rinse and repeat, we have our tray filled up and the block emptied. We'll set the tray aside for now and do one more thing before we put this engine up on the stand. Since it's easy to get to right now, we'll go ahead and remove the flex plate. 
This is held in with six bolts that should be pretty tight. Luckily, the impact gun makes short work of them, and all we have to do is slide the flex plate right off of the crankshaft. Except, well, it doesn't seem like it's in any hurry to move. We'll pry against it to try to get it loose, but we have to be careful. It's called a flex plate for a reason, the whole thing is pretty flexible. But we don't want to pry too hard because we could end up with stress cracks. I'm trying to pry as close to the crank hub as possible to avoid flexing the whole plate. But it just wasn't budging, so we'll have to resort to more drastic measures. In this case, that means the map gas, and we'll hit it for about 20 seconds. The goal is to expand the flex plate around the hub to have it more easily come off. We'll spray some WD-40 on that connection to hopefully get it to soak in, and then hit it with another 30 seconds of heat. This direct application of heat could definitely damage the rear main and oil pan seal, but since it's all being replaced, I wasn't too worried. Once we start prying, there is the smallest of gaps visible, so we are actually making progress. It also would have been a good idea to sand the outer edge of the hub in case some of the rust there was what was causing our issue, but instead of doing that, for some reason, we'll just keep applying heat and prying away. It was starting to get loose, and after one more torching, we were finally able to wiggle it free. There didn't seem to be a lot of rust on these parts, but clearly there was just enough corrosion on that hub to cause us problems. And with that out of the way, it is time to put the engine on the rotating stand. We'll start by lifting up a bit with the engine crane. Then we can pop loose all the fasteners holding the engine cradle to the block. This one has four bolts at the transmission bell housing flange, and two at each side to bolt it up in the engine mount bracket positions. With them loose, we can pop the cradle off of the engine, lift up a bit more, and slide the cradle out from under it. Before we bolt up the engine stand head, we'll use a thread chaser to clean up all of the tapped holes at the transmission bell housing flange. These can get a bit crusty, and we want to make sure our engine stand bolts go in nice and easy. Then we can align the engine stand head and install the random selection of bolts, nuts, and washers that I was able to find so that we have good thread engagement at all four corners. We'll tighten those four until they're just about snug, position the center of the mount at an estimated center of gravity, and tighten those down. We'll also tighten down the bolts and nuts that hold the arms to the flat plate of the assembly. And we're about good to go. We'll lift the engine up until it aligns with the stand, then we can slide the base of the stand on, install the locking pin, and lower down the engine crane. Then off comes the chain, and the engine is finally where it needs to be. And with it solidly up in the air, we'll do one more thing before we continue with this assembly. We will pop out the drain plug for the oil pan to empty out any oil inside. Except, well, it's entirely empty. We'll also crack loose the plugs at the base of the block that run into the coolant passages. Turns out, that's all emptied too, which means at least this should be a little bit less messy. To continue on with disassembly, the first thing we'll do is remove the harmonic balancer. We removed the bolts and I went to clean out the threads with a thread chaser, but it didn't really want to go. They're definitely supposed to be fine thread, but it seems like somebody had previously rammed a coarse threaded bolt in there. I decided to just run in the coarse thread chaser and commit to that. We'll make sure the threads are nice and strong and put some Loctite on the pulley bolts before we put it back together. With that sorted out, we'll install our balancer puller tool with some 3 8 inch coarse thread bolts. We'll get that snugged down, and then we need to keep the crankshaft from turning. To do that, I put a pry bar between the dowel pin and hub at the rear of the crankshaft and jammed it up against the arms of the engine stand head. Then we can get back to the front of the engine and keep cranking down on that balancer puller. Luckily, the balancer started moving right away, so it seemed like it would come off no problem. Just to get a feel for everything, we'll stick with the ratchet until the tension decreases a bit, then we'll switch to the impact gun for the home stretch and hold on to it as we pull it the rest of the way off. Then we'll set the balancer aside and remove the puller tool. Now that that's out of the way, we can start removing the grimy timing cover. There are 10 bolts holding this in, and we'll zap them all loose. Of course, the oil pan has to come off before the timing cover can, and once I remember that, we'll start removing that instead. We'll leave two bolts holding in the cover for now, and flip the engine over. Luckily, it's pretty spot on as far as the center of gravity, but it's still a lot of weight to turn over. 
with it all the way over, we'll lock it in place and we now have easy access to the oil pan. And it was at this point that I realized there were only two bolts holding it on. That means that somebody has had it off before, which is, at the very least, interesting. We'll quickly whiz out those two bolts and then lift the pan free of the block. And the oil pump's gone. At least they left the bolt for it, and I had planned on replacing it anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. We'll unthread the bolt that's supposed to be holding in the oil pump, and get back to the timing cover. With all the bolts out, it's just being held in place by some RTV and the remainders of the oil pan seal. With that loose, we can witness the majesty of the timing chain setup. Clearly, there is a tremendous amount of slack in that chain. It looks like the cam gear has about half a tooth's worth of movement, which on a 38 tooth gear means about 5 degrees. This slack isn't doing the engine any favors, but it probably wasn't running all that bad either. And this is all down to the amazing decision to use plastic teeth on the timing gear. It's yet another part we will definitely be replacing. Moving past that though, with the oil pan off we can take a good look at the rotating assembly of the engine. Luckily, all of those parts seem to be there, and all of the rods are nice and snug on the crankshaft. That's definitely what we want to see. Before we go any farther, so that I don't forget, we're going to go through and number all of the rods. We'll be using a number punch set to engrave each of them with their cylinder number. By punching it into the rod and the cap, it'll also make sure we get those back together and in the correct orientation. We'll take a minute to mark all eight of them, rotating the crankshaft as necessary to get good positioning. Putting the numbers on the outside face of each rod will also tell us the piston orientation. Then we'll use the same punches to mark the main caps one through five. And with that taken care of, we'll get back to the timing chain. We'll zip out the three bolts holding on the camshaft gear and remove it as well as the chain. We'll thread back in the three bolts to help keep track of them, as well as to give us a little bit more grip at the edge of the cam. And using those to get things started, we'll slide the camshaft out of the engine block. A big block cam is pretty heavy, so it requires a fair amount of lifting force to keep it centered in the cam bearings. What we don't want to do is drag the lobes across the bearings or force it out of the block, so we'll be careful and take our time while removing it. We'll set that aside and get to work on the pistons. First we'll loosen the connecting rod bolts, going back and forth and loosening just a little bit at a time so as not to warp anything. And once they're all the way off, we need to separate the connecting rod cap. I was trying to avoid hammering on the rod bolts, so I gave the cap a nice mallet massage, hoping to work it loose, and with a little bit of prying it did. I gave up this technique on the other caps and just gave a few mallet taps to each of the rod bolts and that knocked them loose a bit more easily. Once the cap is off, we can remove its bearing half, and then slide a piece of 3 8 inch hose over each rod bolt to help protect everything as the piston is knocked loose. We'll drop a length of PVC pipe up against the bottom of the piston to help knock it out of its cylinder. And we'll use the mallet to tappy tap it all of the way out. Of course, you also need to be ready to catch it so you don't just shoot it out onto the floor. And there's the number one piston removed. We'll reinstall its cap and thread back on the nuts to help keep track of everything. Then we, excitedly, get to repeat that process seven more times. Throughout this, some of the pistons were resisting more than I expected. The rusty cylinders like 3 and 7 were definitely the worst, but there was also something else going on. And it was only after knocking a few of them out that I realized what it was. You want even more proof that there was water in this engine? That's ice. All the water must have dripped down when we flipped the engine over and it all froze sitting on the top of the piston. I admittedly didn't notice it at the time, but in this clip from right after we flipped the engine over you can see water splashing around in the pistons. That oil ring also full of ice. It's totally frozen and not in the usual sense. Clearly there was still a good amount of water in there. It also tells you how cold it is right now. It's quite cold! But despite the frigid complications, we were still moving forward. And we're finally to the last big part of the engine that needs to come out, the crankshaft. This is a 4-bolt main engine, which makes me really appreciate having the impact on. 
we'll spin loose all of the bolts in the reverse of the torquing sequence. First, just loosening the outer cap bolts, we'll start at the outer edges and work our way towards the center. Then once they're all loose, we'll repeat that same process with the inner bolts. Pretty soon, we have everything loose and the caps are ready to come off. We'll pull out all of the bolts and set aside all but two of them that we'll use to rock the caps loose. Those bolts give us a bit of extra leverage, which we're going to need because the caps are pretty stuck in place. But with a bit of wiggling, we're able to remove the first cap. We'll work our way down the line and do the same for two, three, and four. Pull off the bigger chunks of the oil pan seal that are still stuck to the engine and that rear cap, and try to tap number five back and forth to loosen it up. It took using some long 3 8 inch extensions to really get it moving. We finally got it free of the block, but that rear main seal was so stuck to the cap it would not come off. So we'll just lift the crankshaft straight up out of the engine with that still attached. Of course, just like the cylinder heads, this is nice and heavy. Once that was on the ground, I was able to pry off the rear main seal, which then freed up the rear cap and allowed it to be removed. And with that, we're about finished with the main portion of this disassembly. Back at the engine block, we'll give each of the main bearings a tap at the edge with a mallet to help get them moving. Then we can kind of twist them sideways and lift them up out of the block easily. That rear one with the integrated thrust bearing is being pretty stubborn, but a pry bar helps us get it loose. Even though I wasn't planning on reusing these bearings, it still pays to be careful with everything. That's as far apart as we're taking the engine for now. There are lots of little things left to go, but we got the majority of it. With all the pistons out of the way, we can finally flip the engine back over and take a good look at the cylinder bores. Turns out, the initial impression we got about them was about right. Number two looks pretty reasonable. Number four has a fair amount of rust. Number six looks pretty okay. And number eight doesn't look too bad either. But unfortunately, the other side is where the real problem lies. Number one looks like a bit of a mess. But number three is the worst so far. Some of that is more than just surface rust. Number five isn't winning any beauty contests. And number seven has some rust issues as well. I tried to clean the cylinders up, hoping that some of that would just wipe off, but no such luck. If anything, the oily, watery, rusty mixture was making them look a little bit better than they were. But at this point, it was two in the morning and that would have to be a story for the next day, just like we're at the end of this video. We made good progress though, and we certainly learned a lot about this new Craigslist purchase. Very few of the things we learned were good things, but you know, you can't win them all.